on, somebody give Jesus some praise. Come on, would you stand with me? And if you love Jesus like I do, would you give him some praise, some glory? Turn to your neighbor and say, if you're happy and you know it, then you should surely show it. Come on, one more time. If you love Jesus like I do, give him some praise. Come on, somebody tell Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I thank you. Come on, one more time. Give the Lord some praise in this place. Amen, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. He's only good all the time. And all the time, he's only good. He's not a hater. He's a celebrator. Come on, let's celebrate his goodness, his love, his mercy. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for being here today. All of our guests, thank you so much for being here. You make our services so special, you being with us today. And all of our regulars, thank you for always being so faithful, so consistent, so steady. It are amazing, amen. Come on, just turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for being so consistent and so faithful to the house of destiny. Amen, amen. Again, thank you so much for being here. Give yourselves a hand. We like to make a declaration over the Word of God before we get in it today. So if you have your Bible, your smartphone, or whatever you're going to read Scripture from, if it's your neighbors you're going to read from, hold it up. There's up with you today. Amen. Say this after me. This is my Bible. Come on, Des. This is first service. There's all this real serious Christians at first service. Like, I got to get up and get church over with because I got something to do today. I'm just joking. <laughs> And all the hungry people, well, I'm not going to compare you to all of the services. Let's just start over. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I could have. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive. Come on, turn and tell somebody, I'm about to receive. I'm going to get it today. I'm going to give mine today. The incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never, 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 never be the same. In Jesus' name, 2013. What year are we in? 2019. Going to be my best year yet. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen, amen, amen. Let me pray for us today, and we're going to jump in the Word. Father, I thank you today that ears are here to hear, hearts to receive, minds to comprehend. God, would you speak to all of us today? Spirit of the living God, I ask you to speak directly through me to these your people today, every heart, every ear, every eyes open to receive and hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said amen, amen. amen. Turn to give about five people a high five. Tell them get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. I'm going to make you touch somebody, talk to somebody before you leave. Amen, 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 amen. You know, it's so funny. We're always asking people to shake hands, high five somebody, you know, find four or five people, turn to your neighbor, turn to the other neighbor. You know, we're always trying to give it. And some people, you know, just like, why do I got to do all that? Can't we just get on with the service? It was funny. A story last week came to us that uh, this wife was so mad at her husband. She could hardly, just last Sunday, could hardly sit beside her husband in church. And she came afterwards and she shared the story. She said, Pastor, I, I was so upset with you because I, I said, why, why was you so upset? I said, well, I was so angry with my husband on our way to church. We got into it and sitting beside him at church, I couldn't hardly look at him. And would you know it? You made me turn and high five them and shake their hand and tell them they're good. All this stuff. You made me five different times talk to him. 
You know, after that, she said, after that fifth time was over with, all those feelings I had against him left. See, we never know what God is doing when we're just reacting and loving one another in here. Amen. Now, the rest of you should be clapping because if you're ever in that situation, you need to be pushed to get over it. Amen, amen. Maybe some of you are not clapping because you're in that condition right now. <laughs> well, we're praying for you, amen. Again, good to have you today. And uh, today I want to wrap up. We've been talking about it will happen. Somebody say it, it will, will happen. happen. It's not a maybe. It's not, well, I sure hope so, Pastor. No, it will happen. We've used two basic texts of scriptures that I'm just going to refer to and move forward today, and that is Habakkuk chapter 2. It says, write the vision down, make it plain. Though it tarry, wait for it, it will happen. Somebody say it, it will. will. The Bible says, though it tarry, though it's delayed, my position, my job is to wait for it because it will come to pass. Then Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says, uh, let us not get weary in doing the right thing because if I will keep doing what's right, my season will come to pass. You know, I've said this over and over that the enemy's objective is to get you and I weary in the thing we've been standing for, the thing we've been believing for, the thing we've been trusting God for, the very it, whatever it is, if it's your physical, marital, mental, financial, health, whatever it is. Maybe you're believing for a loved one to get saved. Maybe you're believing for your father to get saved, your mother to get saved, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, maybe a relative, maybe someone at work you've been trying to witness to, trying to get them to Jesus. Maybe whatever it is, it will come to pass. He says, if I don't get weary in doing the right thing, my season will come to pass. Somebody say, my season will come to pass. I don't know if you've ever got tired like I have before, feeling like you're the only one in the situation doing it right. Anybody other than me? Anybody other than me? Or just kind of like not seeing a result in a positive way because you've been doing the thing the right way. Sometimes people throw out, well, there's no reason for me to do that no more. I've been doing everything right and I've not seen anything good come out of it. That's exactly where the enemy tries to get us is to throw in the towel, quit the race, go somewhere else, do something else because he doesn't want us to continue doing the right thing. Here's the guarantee we got from God that if I don't get weary in doing what's right, my season will come to pass. It will happen for me. It will happen in my home. It'll happen in my marriage. It'll happen in my family. Because there's not a promise from God that just comes to pass automatically. Some people say, well, pastor, I'm just waiting on God because I know whenever God gets ready to do it, God will just do it. So I'm just waiting on God. Whenever he's ready, I'm ready. I'm just waiting on God. Listen, God cannot do whatever God wants to do in your life, in my life. He is not at liberty to just do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. God needs my participation, your participation. God wants to, he desires to, but he cannot just do something because he wants to do it without yours or mine permission. I've heard people argue that over and over and over, and I argued it with my pastor for years until he began to show me in the scripture that even though Jesus died over 2,000 years ago, the only way I can inherit salvation, even though salvation was already applied to my account over 2,000 years ago with Jesus on the cross, the scripture says in Romans, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The only way that it will happen of salvation in my life is not because Jesus died, not because God wants me saved, is because I call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Are y'all with me? 
Scripture goes on and says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. That word righteousness means right standing with God. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, the only way salvation manifests in my life is I've got to believe in my heart. I've got to say it with my mouth. Come on. So the only way it will happen, there's a process that I need to participate in. Same way if you're believing for somebody to get saved. Well, Lord, just do it when you're ready. Do it when you're ready, Lord. No, the Lord's been ready 2,000 years ago. That's why he died on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Even though salvation has already been applied for yours and mine situation, I've got to come to the understanding, call on the name of the Lord, believe in my heart, confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and then I am saved. Somebody put an amen on that. Amen. All through the Bible, God always declared what he was going to do before he did it. He always declared it, always spoke it, always released it out. Why? Because he was get, trying to give the people an opportunity to grab a hold of what he said he was going to do, believe he will do it so he could do it. I said all through the Bible, you'll find that God always spoke out what he was going to do before he did it. Because faith has to believe it before faith sees it. I walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. Mark 9, 23 says, all things are possible to the believer. Now today I want to talk about four basic things that I believe if, if you will get these, if, if we will get these down and make these not just promises, but principles, make them something that this is going to be the pattern I'm going to live by. This is going to be the roadmap that I'm going to guide myself by. I believe it will always keep the door of possibilities happening in my life. Somebody say amen. First one is Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. I must understand, number one, that God has the best plan for me. Somebody say, God has the best plan for me. Come on, one more time. Say it out loud. God has the best plan for me. Do you know God doesn't have your destruction plan? God doesn't have your nightmare plan. He doesn't have a problem plan. God has the very best in mind for you. He has the very best in mind for me. What good father, what good mom would have the worst plan for their children? Well, I'm going to have these children and I'm going to plan evil for them. I'm going to plan destruction for them. No, we've got a good God. He is good all the time. And God has the very best in mind for me. He only has good. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, I'm going to read in the message translation. I don't know the scripture they put up there, but it said it this way. I know what I am doing. Come on, somebody say, God knows what he's doing. He said, I have it all planned out to take care of you and not abandon you. Come on, somebody say, and not abandon me but to give me a future and a hope. In other words, God says, hey, I know what I'm doing. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I already know what I'm doing and I got it all planned out for you. The King James Version says it this way, I know the plans and the thoughts that I have towards you and they are not evil. You know the reason I ran from God? Because I thought God was out to get me. My mom would then would get me to church, pray me into the altar, and I'd get in there. And next thing you know, somebody would tell me, God's going to get you for that. 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 Oh, you better turn or burn, fly or fry. God's going to get you. God's going to get you. Oh, my God, I'm scared to be around you. God's going to get you. And next thing you know, I ran and I ran and I ran and I ran. I'm like, my Lord, if that's kind of a God he is, it was almost... Not that somebody was trying to say this literally, but it was implied that destruction was in front of me because that's what God does. God, God, you either turn or burn. And so I would run from God because I did wrong. I made a mistake. I dropped the ball. 
If you're not careful as a parent, when your kids disobey you, they will shy away from you. They will hold their head down. They won't look you in the eye. They won't be able to talk to you. They can't be around you. They will want to distance themselves from you. Why? It's not that they, they're not, uh, they don't believe they did anything wrong. No, they're fully aware of it, but they're afraid of any communication with you because they're afraid of you to find out because they only have torture in mind. They only have bad in mind. See, God doesn't have evil in store for you. He don't have bad in store for you. He's a good God and he wants you to know that if even when you fall, even when I make a mistake, he wants me to run to God because he's faithful to forgive. He's faithful to give me another chance. I still got to confess it. I still have to repent. I've got to turn from my way, but he's not there to shove me out and punish me because I made a mistake. No, Bible says, for the love of God covers a multitude of sin. Thank you. It covers it because God don't want you and I running from him. God wants you to run to him. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I made a mistake, Lord. I dropped the ball. I was wrong, God. Please forgive me. I call on your grace and your mercy. I'm never doing that again. I'm turning from my wicked ways. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I don't want nothing to hinder your goodness on my life. It's called repentance. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is turning from that course of action, that course of life. Somebody say amen. amen. So I have to understand, number one, the very it that God's going to do in my life, the it that will happen is God's best is always on his mind. God's always planning the good for me. My best days are ahead of me. I've not missed anything yet. Amen. I was thinking about this this past week, uh, just enjoying some time that God, there's still so much more still in store. You still have so much more in my life, in my family, in my marriage. We've not missed any good days. We've not bypassed anything. Yeah, there's a lot of things I wish I could go back and change, but you know what? I can't change yesterday. Yesterday has already happened. It's already over with, but what I can change is today, and I can change tomorrow, and I can change this week, and I can change this month. So many times we sit around and live in yesterday. It's over. You can't change it. Let's move forward. God still has goodness. He still has great in mind. He says, I know the thoughts and the plans I have for you, and they are not evil. Why would God have to address they are not evil if we wouldn't immediately to think there's something wrong in our life he's going to do? No, God wants to establish his will, establish his way always that everything I got planned for you, your marriage, your home, your job, your career, your children, they're good and they're going to give you hope and they're going to prosper you and they're going to bless you. They're not evil. They're not bad thoughts. They're always good thoughts. Somebody say good thoughts. Number two, I have to remember that if it's not happening the way God wants it to happen, I have to take the limits off. Come on, somebody say, take the limits off. We limit God with our doubts. We limit God without remembering of all the good things God has done. Somebody say, take off the limits. You know, you can limit your marriage. You can limit your children. You can limit your own dreams. You can limit your own thought life. You can limit, you can put limits around you by not remembering how far you've already came. I remember when I was trying to get off drugs and in a drug rehab and all these things and I went a whole year and a half doing everything perfect, but then it got time to be released and let out of the program and put back into the world and all of a sudden fear hit me because I was afraid of falling. I was afraid of blowing it, of erasing everything of any good that's happened. 
I begin to limit myself and begin to immediately think of failure instead of any success. Do you know why that was? Is I was limiting Chad. What do you mean by that? I was limiting myself because I wasn't counting or adding up all the days for a year and a half. I made the right choice. I made the right decision. And I got up every day and I said no to my flesh. And I said yes to God. Why? Because the program I was in, you could leave any time you wanted to. It wasn't court ordered. You could walk in and you could walk out, whatever you wanted to do. And I had to decide every day I'm staying another day. I didn't think, I couldn't even think about a week. I couldn't think about 30 days, six months, a year from now. I got through one day. Okay, well, since I'll stay tomorrow. What are you, okay, then next day, what are you going to do? I'm going to stay tomorrow. And enough decisions of staying until the next day, a year and a half later, and what got me out of the program that I can live the life God's called me to live is I had to remember and start adding up all the good days I've had, how many great Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you come too far to turn back now. Remove the limits. Some of us limit our marriage. What do you mean, Pastor? I just don't know. I just don't know anymore about my marriage. Well, what do you mean? Well, the last six months has been hell. How long have you been married? 50 years. Oh, and somebody here, how long y'all been married? 46 years? I thought me and Marlo's married long. 46 years? Y'all almost been as married long as I'm. How old I am, my Lord. Hallelujah. But here's the thing. If you're not careful, you'll limit your marriage because really you've probably had more good days than you've had bad days. But that's not what we think about. We start adding up those bad days. If there's another bad day, I ain't put... I know y'all don't do that. I do it. But here's the thing. You don't realize you're limiting yourself, but not so much limiting yourself, you're limiting God. And God's one you don't want to put the limits on. You want to live a limitless life with God. You'd never want to limit God. You might limit you. You might limit your friends. But don't limit God. Will you go with me to Psalms chapter 78? Psalms 78. Turn to your neighbor and say Psalms 78. 78. Chapter 78. Go there with me and I want to show you something here. How important it is to remove the limits. Don't limit God. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit your marriage. Don't limit your income. Don't limit your life. Verse 38 says, but he being full of compassion. Somebody say full of compassion. The Bible says here in Psalm 78 verse 38 says, but he being full of compassion, he forgave their iniquities and destroyed them not. Yay! Many a time he, God, turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. Come on, somebody put an amen on that. Look what he says. But God being full of compassion, he forgave their iniquities. Those transgressions, those iniquities that you do over and over and over. He forgave their iniquities and destroyed them not. Many a time he turned away his anger and he did not stir up his wrath. For God remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and they grieved him in the desert? Yes, they turned back and they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. Verse 42, because they did not remember his hand nor the day he delivered them from their enemy. You know how I can see where I've limited God in my life is I forgot all the good things he's delivered me from in the past. How 
many times his hand was on me when I didn't deserve his hand on me. How many times he showed mercy when I didn't deserve mercy. How many times he kept being good when I did nothing for him to be good to. How many times he made a way in my wilderness? How many times he watered me in my dry season? How many times he was always there, always faithful? He got me out of this jam, out of this jam, out of this jam, and out of this jam. And the Bible says they limited the Holy One of Israel because they did not remember his hand. You know God's hand's on you for good? And he will not remove his hand on your life. Come on, somebody say, God's hand is on me for good. Now, the Bible says here that the children of Israel, they limited God. They provoked God. They grieved God in their wilderness and in the desert. That's where they tempted him. And they grieved him because they did not remember his goodness and his delivering power. You know, the only way God can be limited in your life is for you and I to forget all the good things, all the miracles, all the manifestation, all the breakthroughs that he's done time and time again. I wish I had a witness in here today and somebody to testify by their actions of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm going to keep waiting because you're limiting him right now by not giving him some praise. I'm not talking about me being good to you. I'm talking about the goodness of the Lord on your life. Amen. Listen, I'm the only one that can limit God for what God wants to do in my life. You can be seated. I'm the only one that can limit him. You know what? You cannot limit God for Chad. And you know, I cannot limit God for you. Your mama can't limit God for you. Your daddy can't limit God for you. The president can't limit God for you. Congress can't limit God for you. The Senate, the who's who, the what, what, your next door neighbor, your supervisor, the bank. Nobody can limit God what God's got planned for you. Only you can limit God by not remembering. <laughs> oh, easy, 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 easy. I'm about to buck and run. Amen. I'm moving a little slow today. I have been recovering so good. I mean, doing amazing. I mean, felt like a million dollars. And yesterday, we was floating in the lake, just floating there, and we made a horrible decision. Well, it wasn't that bad, but we went and saw 47 meters, I think something like that. It's, it's about uh, these people go down on the water. This new movie just came out, 47 meters, they go down, and there's these sharks. Oh, Lord, I ain't going to ruin the movie for you. Uh, but they're, they're, they're anyways, I won't, uh, anyways. <laughs> so we're out in the lake yesterday. We're floating in the water. We're floating there. And there's several of us out. We're just laying there. And I got my life jacket on. I ease down in the water. And I'm just laying there floating. Like, oh, this is heaven on earth. This is heaven. I love it. Water just relaxes me. I'm just laying out there. And well, Marla, had, Marla had floated away. And about 20 minutes before that, she, she says something about, can you see down in there? Before we got in the water, look, can you see down in there? She said, I hope there ain't none of them sharks in there in that 47 meters. I ain't thought about shark being in a lake in my whole life. Anyways, I'm floating in the water, just easing, just enjoying it. You know, I'm getting ready to preach tomorrow. It's going to be a good day. I'm going to make it. It's all well. And next thing I know, something underwater hit me right there. <laughs> I squealed like a pig, and I've come flying up, twisting, jerking, trying to get out of that water as fast as possible. And all I could hear was this hysterical laugh from behind me. 
and turned around. It was Marla, and she laughed for 30 minutes, couldn't even get out of the water laughing like, you should have saw your face. I, you should have. I thought your rib hurt. I said, it does all over again now. I think I just cracked one. I told her, I said, I was fine. I wouldn't get, normally that wouldn't have bothered me. Like, what, what was that? A minnow or something. What was that? But I said, a while ago, you start talking about that 47 meters of sharks in the water that they was somewhere that there was not supposed to be sharks. And, and the whole time I was in there, I, I felt a twig. I, oh. You know, nobody can limit you but you. Seriously. And this is why I see so many believers, they get saved, they start loving God, they start serving God, they're faithful to church, but yet they limit him because the longer they're saved, the less they remember. When's the last time you remembered? No hands. Well, that's why I'm preaching this subject today. Now think about it. Just the other day, I was meditating on this scripture and I just started thanking God. Thank you for being there with me in 1985. Thank you when they were going to arrest me and throw me in jail when they kicked me out of school, but yet they, they allowed me to get into rehab. They let me get in the boys' home. Thank you for being there. Thank you for being there in communist China when I was arrested for smuggling Bibles into communist China and they put me in a holding tank. Thank you for not, I'm not still there in China today from smuggling Bibles. Thank you, Lord, that the door opened up and they let me out. True story, I was smuggling Bibles into China to underground churches and I got arrested and they put me in a holding tank for about six hours and then finally the missionary we were with come and he gave some papers and some stuff that he had with him and got me out of there and I was thanking the Lord that day thank you because I could still be there I could still be in that jail for doing what was right I was doing the right thing and I'm the one that got arrested I don't know if you've ever sat down and started going back and remembering of the goodness of God and how he was there, he was faithful, he showed up, he might not have been early, he might not have been late because he's always on time. The only way it will not happen for you is if you limit God, you limit the Holy One of Israel because we did not remember his delivering power. Who am I talking to? The Amplified Bible says it this way, they did not remember seriously the miracles of the working of his hand, nor the day he delivered them from their enemy. I don't know about you, but how many times when that car should have hit you, you should have went off the road, something should have happened and all of a sudden you were like, oh my God, thank you, Jesus. Woo, thank you. Woo, thank you. Woo. And all of a sudden today a bird flies by your window and you're like, hold on, Jesus. You start planning for defeat. When God spared you, you're living today, you're better today than you've ever been. You may not be where you want to be, but you're on your way. Remove the limits. Take off the limits. Number three, don't give your limitations any respect. You know, the problem happened in Numbers chapter 13 is... They were right there getting ready to possess the promised land. 40 years in the wilderness and they're getting ready. Everything they've been living for, believing for, striving for, serving for was right in front of them. The grapes, the milk, the honey, it overflowed. The whole reason they left Egypt to begin with is God had a better 
place in mind and prepared for them. A land full of promise. Do you know God's got that promised land for you? It may not be a geographical location. It could be your own home. It could be your own dwelling place in your heart. It could be in your own thoughts. That's a land that is full of promise. Numbers 13, they sent the spies to go spy out the land and see is everything really in the land that God said was in the land? You know, it's like some Christians today in church. Is, is that many people really getting saved? Is that many people really going to discipleship? Everybody's wondering. Well, we hear the report. Is that really happening? They sent the spies. How many were there, 12 or 10? Huh? 12, 12. So they sent 12 spies to spy out the land to bring back a report. Go see if what's in the land is really what God said. The Bible says they went and they looked and they came back and 10 of them said, everything, <laughs> can we go right now? Everything is in the land that God said was in the land. It really is there. Telling everybody, everything's there. Come on, let's go. Get stuff, get stuff, let's go. All of a sudden, but two spoke up. Yeah, but there's giants in the land. We don't want no more giants. Ten, huh? Oh, sorry. I'm glad y'all know the Bible better than me. But anyways, here we go. Why'd God pick me? I don't even know the Bible. Lord have mercy. I don't know why he picked me to do this job. But anyways, there was 12 went and spied the land. Two came back. Yeah, all right. Two came back with the good report. There we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Pow, pow. Anyways. Hey, I forgot. Gentlemen, tomorrow night, free barbecue here at Desi for all of our men. Free barbecue. Men, free barbecue. Lord have mercy. What time tomorrow night? What time tomorrow night? 6.30, be here, be square. Tomorrow night, free barbecue. Come, bring somebody with you. It's going to be the bomb.com. Okay, back to the sermon. 10 of them, 12 went in, 10 came back with a good report, said everything's in the land. Right? 10 came back. Two. Who's preaching? She does that at home, don't she, Dean? I bet you she's like, you got it all wrong, Dean. You got it all wrong. All right, 12 went in, 10 came back. No, 12 came back. I got it. 12 came back. Two of them had a good report. Now you want to show up. <laughs> 12 of them came back. Two had a good report. 10 had a bad report. Two of them said, everything's in the land that we've waited 40 years for. 10 of them said, yeah, but there's giants in the land. And we were in our own sight, grasshoppers in face of those giants. Not they were in the sight of the giant's mind grasshoppers. They said, we saw ourselves like a little bitty grasshopper in the face of those giants. You know what the problem was? Two of them remembered God in the wilderness and in the desert and delivering them time and time again. 10 of them forgot and they gave their limitations respect. 
and they got their eyes on the giants and off the promise. Somebody say, don't give your limitations any respect. Now I got to do number four. Even though they started the piano early, that, you know what that sign means when y'all hear it in the future, wrap it up. <laughs> My wife sent him up there. Hey, get, get up there. Get up there. <laughs> Remember who signs your check. We was on vacation the other day. I told my kids, I told Chas and Michaela, I said, yeah, one day y'all going to run the church. Me and mom's going to be out. We're just going to travel around. Uh, we're going to live here, da 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 give us some things. And I uh, found a little lake house up, uh, uh, LBJ Lake. I said, you know, I'm probably going to buy a lake house up here. It's about an hour away. We'll show up maybe second service, third service, somewhere in there. We'll, we'll show up. I said, I'm going to give you all the keys to the church. The only thing you ain't going to control is the checkbook. Ha, <laughs> ha. Ooh, Lord, tell me about it, Jesus. Tell me about it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Number four is the biggest one. It trumps everything I just said. Is you got to learn to be happy. You got to learn to be happy. I said, you got to learn to be happy. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says, A merry heart does good like medicine. You know what? Sometimes, church, you got to learn to just be happy in the season you're in. Be happy with what's going on. Be happy where you're at. Be happy with everything in your life. Just learn to be happy because the Bible says a merry heart does good like medicine. Every once in a while, I got to tell Marla, did you take your pill this morning? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, chill with your pill. Listen, you got to learn that the Bible says a happy heart works like medicine in you. Come on, when you're happy and you know it, your life should surely show it. Come on, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is your strength. You got to learn to be happy where you are, what you're doing. Because if laughter works like medicine, you need to learn to laugh. You know, right now, I could just start laughing on my own. <laughs> just look at some of you. <laughs> look what they're wearing. <laughs> no, listen, you just got to learn. You got to learn to be happy. There's enough going on in the world to not be happy. But if laughter works like medicine in you, means it's healing in you, it's powerful in you. It does something great in you. You got to learn to be happy. You got to enjoy your happiness. You cannot let anything get in your life that's going to make you unhappy. You got to learn to just rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Bible says, for the joy of was set before him. Jesus endured the cross because the joy was in front of him. Listen, you and I got to remember that it's the joy of the Lord that gives us our strength. Psalm 61 verse 3 says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The Bible says to put on, clothe yourself with the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's amazing to me. I did this so many times in my life. When I'm feeling down, I put down music on. When I'm feeling down, I don't want to talk to nobody. Especially that guy that's really excited all the time. Like, get him away from me right now. But the Bible doesn't say put darkness on, 
Put heaviness on when the spirit of heaviness comes on you. Put a cloud over you when the spirit of heaviness is on you. It says, listen, if you want to come out of that dark season, you want to come out of that heavy place, you want to come out of that cloud, you put a garment of praise on for, 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 for the spirit of heaviness. You got to get a praise in your mouth. You got to get a dance in your feet. You got to learn to put a garment of praise on for the spirit of heaviness. See, being happy is a choice. Listen, if you depend on, here's why I made a mistake years ago, I depended on something to make me happy. Either people, stuff, alcohol, drugs, whatever, to make me happy. But the problem is when that stuff lifts or those people are not around you no more, you're back to you. Somebody, some people are happy in church. As long as they're in church, they get out of here, the happiness leaves. That's why he says, it's your job and my job to put on the spirit of praise, a garment of praise for spirit of heaviness. You got to learn to clothe yourself. You got to learn, you know what I'm going to do? It may not be the way I want it to be. It may not be happening the way I want it to happen. But one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to limit God in my life. And I'm not going to forget all the goodness that he's done. So I'm going to learn to be happy right now because this season is about to change. In my midnight hour, God's going to show up. God's going to turn it around. So I'm going to start rejoicing where I am. I'm going to rejoice with the people I'm around. I'm going to rejoice in the place that I'm in. I'm going to learn to be happy where I am. Lord, thank you for getting me here. Thank you where I am today. Come on, somebody. Would you stand all over this room?